Foundation. Wednesday, the House Government Reform and Oversight Committee reviewed the 1993 travel office firings and adopted a report on the matter. The Committee on Government Reform and Oversight will come to order. The committee meets today for a business meeting to attend to several pending matters. We will consider two reports. First, the investigation of White House travel office firings and related matters. And second, uh, sampling and statistical adjustment in the decennial census, fundamental flaws. The committee will also consider two bills. The first one, a post office renaming bill to designate a post office in Camden, Arkansas as the Honorable David H. Pryor Post Office Building. And we will also uh, consider S-868 to provide authority for leave transfer for federal employees who are adversely affected by disasters or emergencies and for other purposes. We will now begin with a report entitled Investigation of White House Travel Office Firings and Related Matters. Uh, as we meet to consider this report describing the events surrounding the firings of the seven White House travel office workers, I would note that upon becoming chairman of this committee two years ago, I stated my intention at that time to conduct a comprehensive investigation into these firings because in the view of many, uh, including myself, none of the previous six investigations that had been carried out were adequate or uh, definitive. Before the committee today is the product of our committee's investigation. I believe it deserves the support of the committee and the attention of the American people. Some of my colleagues I know uh, think that this uh, doesn't matter and that we are wasting the time of this committee. And I can understand that point of view, but I must say I completely disagree. The highest levels of our government need to be held accountable for their actions. The Clinton administration seems frankly incapable or unwilling uh, to cooperate in responsible oversight in this and many other matters. And that, after all, is the primary function of this committee, uh, is to conduct uh, fair but uh, complete and thorough oversight. Indeed, they vigorously countered each and every previous investigation's efforts to bring out the facts um, all of those investigations did not have access to many of the documents or indeed many of the witnesses which this uh, committee has had an opportunity to either depose and documents that we have seen. Uh, they withheld documents, scripted congressional hearings, interjected themselves into the committee's deposition process. But in the end, the Clinton administration could not really outspin the facts or the truth. If the committee had not pursued this matter with equal vigor, the American people never would have seen David Watkins' so-called soul-cleansing memo where he spells out what happened and who directed the action. The American people never would have seen Vince Foster's travel office notebook, which documents his concern and growing despair over the ramifications of the firings. And perhaps most importantly, Craig Livingstone and company might still be perusing the confidential FBI files of hundreds of former Reagan and Bush administration officials. In choosing to, I can only characterize it as obstruct rather than cooperate, to contain rather than explain, and spin rather than govern, the travel office is a powerful statement on the Clinton White House's failed record in living up to their own ethical promises and obligations to the people who elected them. This report lays out the story of an abuse of power at the highest levels of the White House, the likes of which have not been fully revealed to public to date. The report demonstrates the failures of this White House to live up to the ethical standards they themselves promised to maintain. This is not just the story of the seven travel office workers who were summarily fired on May 19, 1993, ordered to vacate their offices within two hours and carted off uh, that very day in a van. It is the story of how the power of the presidency was brought down on individuals who were put under the specter of a criminal investigation and had powerful federal agencies, including the FBI and the IRS, unleashed on them in an ongoing campaign to discredit them. It is also a story of systematic and deliberate cover-ups of embarrassing or 
potentially incriminating activities. Billy Dale bore, uh, as, the, as the head of the travel office, bore the brunt of the federal onslaught before the, the uh, president, the first lady, and their friends from Arkansas and Hollywood came to Washington. Billy Dale was just another man working to support his family. Uh, he and his co-workers were dedicated to their jobs and worked hard at them, regardless of which party controlled the office of the president. Billy Ray Dale had been there for uh, decades, uh, as had most of the other members of the uh, White House Travel Office. Every aspect of Billy Dale's life was questioned during this period. Friends and family were hounded and harassed. Every past deed scrutinized, all with the full intention of prosecuting Mr. Dale in an effort to justify the unjustifiable. Now, regrettably, Mr. Dale is uh, a continuing symbol of what can happen to people who get in the way of members of this <clears throat> administration, including the first family, who abused their power and took advantage of their access. Why would someone do this? To generate positive news stories about the president cleaning up the White House, that was one suggested reason. To make government work better as part of the National Performance Review, another uh, reason suggested by this administration. To streamline the travel office operations, uh, uh, another scenario. While the White House has asked uh, the American public to believe these or accept these reasons or excuses, they are in fact part of a really elaborate cover scheme designed to submerge the raw ambition and frankly appalling arrogance exhibited by the participants in this matter. In fact, one of the key moments of this investigation came when the White House in a miraculous discovery last January belatedly produced the, uh, in his own words, uh, Mr. Watkins defined it as a soul cleansing memo. Uh, our investigation has found that this memo is substantially, substantially corroborated by numerous records and witnesses te testimony under oath developed over the past uh, two years by this investigation. The report also shows that the plan to fire the travel office workers and replace them with campaign personnel and Harry Thomas's associates was in place from the early days of the administration. And the report establishes that Harry Thomason, who had a potential financial stake in the travel business, instigated the firing of the travel office employees. Mr. Thomason had personnel, personal and financial stakes in ensuring that the former travel office employees were fired, which made it clearly inappropriate for him to have any involvement in this entire matter. President Clinton approved Harry Thomason's so-called image project at the White House, giving Harry Thomason an official status in the White House. And this facilitated Harry Thomason's efforts to obtain lucrative government contracts. Harry Thomason abused his official status and White House access at a time when he had a financial stake in the travel business. Contrary to the conclusions of the Department of Justice, Harry Thomason's activities at the White House make him, I think clearly, a special government employee to which the confines of the conflict of interest laws apply. And I would point out that the Justice Department did not have access to much of the information that we have developed in this uh, committee, uh, which I think corroborates that, in fact, Mr. Thomason was a special government employee. Mrs. Clinton, acting in part on Harry Thomason's now proven to be baseless allegations of wrongdoing against the travel office employees, asserted pressure on senior White House tra uh, staff to fire the travel office employees. The decision to fire the travel office staff was taken with the full knowledge of the President and the active support of the First Lady to reward political supporters and a presidential cousin who wanted to corral the White House travel office business and take advantage of whatever opportunities might otherwise be available. When the public reacted with outrage, as they should have, to the firings, the White House deployed the rapid response team, which immediately accused the travel office workers of gross mismanagement and possible criminal behavior. To this day, Billy Dale continues to be the subject of an ongoing uh, smear or vilification campaign orchestrated and operated uh, out of the White House. The second part of the story is of the White House in full damage control mode. Fully intent on containing the fallout from an embarrassing episode and limiting the exposure of the President and the First Lady. They did this by repeatedly denying they had any role, any role in the firings. They suggest that if you deny it enough times, people might ultimately begin to believe it, even in the face of persuasive documentary and testimonial evidence. 
White House officials covered up the real reasons for the firings of the White House Travel Office employees. The firings were not, I stress, were not based on the Pete Marwick review, which was instigated long after the decision had been made to remove the Travel Office employees. Uh, as I said, but rather it was decided before Pete Marwick examiners ever even set foot in the White House. Then the White House mischaracterized the review. It was neither an audit nor was it independent. It was directed by a White House which did not want an audit to be conducted. White House Associate Counsel William Kennedy abused the FBI by repeatedly invoking the, in his words, quote, highest levels of the White House in meetings with the FBI. The FBI erred by allowing the White House to control its investigation. The FBI mishandled the travel office investigation from the beginning by not exercising independence from political appointees at the White House and by not securing a travel office records by not securing travel office records in a timely fashion. The Justice Department improperly deferred to the White House during this investigation, during its investigations of the White House Travel Office and Harry Thomason, and ignored the objective behavior exhibited by the Council's office. In a pattern to be repeated many, many times, the White House engaged in a conspiracy, a sort of culture of silence of the true story behind the firings from the very first day. It did so for damage control purposes. President Clinton established a cover-up situation when he inappropriately placed the person who had approved the firings, Mac McClarty, in charge of the investigation, and McClarty withheld information in the course of the investigation. It is inappropriate for the White House to investigate itself in matters of conflict. The internal White House management review, overseen by current White House Chief of Staff Leon Panetta and former Chief of Staff McClarty, was a catalog of quote, mistakes and deception, close quote, which is a quote from the New York Times. It omitted incriminating information about the President, Mrs. Clinton, and Harry Thomason. The White House chose to cover up incriminating information for political expediency. The White House Management Review reprimanded people who were only following the orders of higher-ups who were the real instigators of the firings. The White House's obstruction of the review of Vince Foster's documents was due in part to concerns about Travelgate documents in Mr. Foster's custody. Mrs. Clinton instructed White House staff on the handling of Foster documents and the Foster note found on July 26, 1993, and senior White House staff covered up this information and kept it from investigators for many, many months. The report exposes the misconduct of the White House Counsel's Office in repeatedly trying to throttle this investigation with lawyerly tricks, word games, and invalid and overreaching claims of executive privilege. White House officials repeatedly engaged in a pattern of delay and obstruction over the course of three years of investigations into the travel office and matters related to Vince Foster's tragic death. President Clinton has engaged in an unprecedented misuse of the executive power, abuse of executive privilege, and obstruction of numerous investigations into the travel office matter. We have spent a very long time investigating not just who fired these individuals and why, but also the wrongdoing that followed. And the resulting mosaic pieced together from the facts reveals the answers the White House refused to disclose. In the process of blocking our inquiry, the White House damaged, I think, its own credibility. It turned the White House into a political damage control operation. It made frivolous claims of executive privilege. It abused its powers to smear and innocent citizens, and most important, it failed to level with the American people. And finally, the report maintains that the White House has not faithfully upheld and executed the Constitution and laws of the nation. Rarely has the President and his staff done so much to cover up improper actions and hinder the public's right to learn the truth. I urge the members to support the report. The clerk will now call up the report. White House travel office firings and related matters. Without objection, the report will be considered as read, and I would ask if anyone wishes to speak on the report, and I recognize the gentleman from California, Mr. Waxman. Mr. Chairman, it gives me no pleasure to conclude that the report you bring before us today is an embarrassment to you, to this committee, and to this Congress. Your investigation has sacrificed fairness to political expediency and unsubstantiated character attack. What should have been an objective inquiry into the events surrounding the White House Travel Office has degenerated into a shameful 
and crashly partisan smear campaign against President Clinton, Mrs. Clinton, and this administration. Let's look at both procedure and substance in deciding whether this is an objective inquiry. By any measure, the procedures you and your staff have followed have violated any sense of fairness or regard for due process. The committee has leaked selective information to the media and never hesitated to make damning allegations before any reliable evidence was available. Just this past week, the draft report was leaked to the press before it was even shared with members of this committee. In fact, it now seems the committee is relying on the media to fact check its work. The original draft leaked by your staff breathlessly reported a key meeting between President Clinton and Harry Thomason. The only problem, as the press discovered, is that the meeting never took place. But the truth, as is clear in today's report, is not the point. This is a case of reaching conclusions without fact and a report that substantiates uh, and substitutes innuendo for evidence. The limited time given me to, does not permit recounting all the absurdities in this report, but I will try to summarize the highlights. First, the report concludes that the truth about the dismissal of the travel office employees might never be known, notwithstanding the fact that the committee has spent millions of taxpayers' dollars, conducted 72 depositions, held 23 informal interviews, reviewed 58,734 documents from the White House, and another 45,000 from other federal agencies. Although the committee received every document it requested from the White House and was able to depose every administration employee it sought, the committee still accuses the administration of thwarting the investigation. And what does the committee have to show for almost two years of work and the millions spent? First, it concedes that the president had absolute legal right to dismiss the seven employees at the travel office. Just as Newt Gingrich had every right, legally, to dismiss hundreds of employees in the House of Representatives. Then it concludes that the White House engaged in a, quote, colossal damage control effort, end quote, and, quote, an enormous and elaborate cover-up operation of this perfectly legal action. But the committee offers no proof to substantiate this charge. And notwithstanding its inability to find evidence of any illegal behavior, the committee accuses the White House of standing in contempt of its constitutional responsibilities to faithfully uphold and execute the Constitution and laws of the nation. And then in ludicrous hyperbole, the report claims that never before has a president and his staff done so much to cover up improper actions and hinder the public's right to learn the truth? Has the chairman lost all sense of proportion? You have spent over a million dollars, you have harassed scores of innocent White House employees, and you have found no proof of wrongdoing. Yet you are alleging that this matter dwarfs the constitutional crisis we faced in Watergate or the Iran-Contra affair. No, this isn't fair play or objective investigation. Fortunately, we don't have to speculate on what it really is. Newt Gingrich told us what it is two years ago. In October 1994, the Speaker announced that if the Republicans took control, they would use subpoena power to investigate the Clinton administration and uncover corruption. What's clear today is that he meant corruption that is real or imagined. It makes no difference. Mr. Chairman, this multi-million dollar witch hunt has cost dozens of innocent people millions of dollars in legal fees. They have had to endure endless hours of depositions in a fruitless search 
for startling revelations. Yet, not only doesn't this committee have the decency to conclude the truth, it makes matters worse by issuing this shameful and unsubstantiated report. I listened carefully to the words the chairman used in his opening statement. Political expediency, overreaching, uh, damaging its own credibility, smearing innocent citizens, all of those words that you used about the White House apply to this committee. And let me add on as well, appalling arrogance. This report it is, a, is an embarrassment that should be rejected by this committee and would be rejected by this committee if we weren't facing an election and this committee weren't doing a partisan. I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you, John Burns. Comments. I might just point out before recognizing additional members that I share with you your concern about the leaking of any of the reports that are, are um, issued by this committee. I was equally concerned at the leaking of the Census uh, Bureau report, which was leaked earlier. Uh, I don't defend that. I, I uh, condemn it. Can you explain it, Mr. Chairman? Because it we was are, your staff that leaked well, it. Well, uh, can you explain how the census uh, well, office... I'm, I'm, this is, this we, is are, we, we, should, we both you don't share... You don't leaking. The gentleman, we, are both, we both share a responsibility to prevent this sort of thing from happening. I will work with the gentleman to ensure that this doesn't happen. But I, I would also point out that the entire report was not leaked. This was a, a, a preliminary sort of summary so that the entire report was not on the table. Mr. And Chair I would now Mr. ask Chairman, if, uh, may I inquire of you, since you raised this point, uh, rather than the regular order of recognizing members on the uh, matter before us? And you are the chairman of the committee. I have no explanation for some leaking uh, that may have taken place that I know nothing about, but you're the chairman of the committee. And we know there has been a leaking of every bit of information, including this report, before those of us on this committee had a chance to view it. Don't you have an explanation for us? It's your staff that apparently acted. Have you no responsibility for your staff? We have, in fact, uh, you know, discussed this matter with the staff. I have their assurance that it was not leaked from this staff, uh, and we are pursuing uh, other uh, explanations. But I would, uh, I would ask the gentleman to join with me in establishing procedures by which we can prevent any leaking of any reports going forward including the census report, which went out earlier. And now would recognize... Mr. Chairman, if I no, might I'm further, this is a serious matter, and we ought to have an Greg investigation order. of it. The gentleman's out of order. I would now seek uh, if there... Uh, the gentleman from uh, Indiana is recognized for five minutes. Mr. Chairman, uh, I hope we don't take our eye off of the ball. The fact of the matter is this report speaks for itself. The gentleman uh, from California, Mr. Waxman, said that uh, the White House had the right to remove the people at the travel office. No one disputes that fact. It's the manner in which they dismissed those people that we're concerned about. Getting the FBI involved, discrediting law-abiding citizens who have done nothing but work hard for this country for a long period of time bringing Billy Dale to trial was a tragic misuse of power. Sure, they could have fired all of them just like that and put all of Mr. Clinton's friends in that, those positions immediately if they so chose. But they didn't chose, choose to do that. And the reason they didn't is because the media people that worked with the White House who were sitting over there liked the travel office employees and thought they were doing a good job and a service to them and to this country by the way they handled their jobs. So they didn't want to get the media upset. So what they decided to do was to find some way to discredit the people in the travel office so they could legitimately fire them and not have egg on their face. Well, it backfired. And that's what this report's all about, the abuse of power, discrediting or trying to discredit law-abiding citizens for their political ends and their political gains. That is wrong. It is dead wrong. It was a misuse of power. It was an abuse of power. And this report says it very, very clearly. Now, the White House has sent up here to my colleagues, and I'm not questioning anybody's integrity, but they it very, very clearly. Now, the White House 
has sent up here to my colleagues, and I'm not questioning anybody's integrity, but they have scripted. We found this from the documents that were sent up here. They scripted as much as possible these hearings by sending questions to the minority so they could ask questions that would obfuscate the issue or stop us from getting at the facts. This is a fact. These were in the documents that were sent up here from the White House. So the White House has been trying to cover this up, this investigation from day one. The bottom line is this. There was a misuse of power. Innocent people at the travel office were hurt. Billy Dale and his family have suffered incredible heartache over this because they wanted to put their friends in. They could have done it easily. They didn't do it the right way. They should suffer the consequences. This is a good and accurate report, and I personally resent the minority saying that it isn't. With that, I yield back the balance of my time. Thank the gentleman. Uh, the gentle lady from New York, Mrs. Slaughter, is recognized for five minutes. I thank you uh, very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman, for two years that I've been on this committee, um, I honestly didn't think we could reach any lower level than we had already, but I see that we have. Uh, since I've been here, we have revisited Waco over and over again. Uh, we've attempted the destruction of all nonprofit agencies in America, such as the Red Cross, the Girl and Boy Scouts, Salvation Army. Uh, we decided that clean water and clean air didn't need to be clean anymore, and if you wanted to clean, you could do it at home yourself. Tried to stop meat inspection. But in addition, the most important thing is this two-year concentration on the White House has prevented this committee, which is the only one with the oversight of federal agencies, from doing its legislative responsibility. And I think that's a tragedy of the first order. In addition, the millions of dollars that have been spent on this committee, uh, from Waco on down to all the rest of it, have really come to absolutely nothing. And I think that people out in, the, in America understand that there is simply nothing here. Everybody has been examined from their dental records up and down. Um, and it's, there's a level of hypocrisy, I think, here that is very troubling to me. Whether it's the travel office or the White House database, I think that all that we're doing here is trying to deflect attention away from the ethical problems that uh, other people have in Congress. For example, if we want to talk about an abuse of power, sitting on the report on Speaker G uh, Gingrich and the Ethics Committee is probably the greatest abuse of power that I've seen in my lifetime. He's been under investigation, as you know, for a number of the two years of this term. And after eight months of an outside counsel investigation, we don't know a thing in the world about it. I think that American people really, instead of listening this morning about what happens with White House databases and FBI files and uh, maybe the travel office, would really like to know what the Speaker of the House has done. And, uh, but we are going to make sure that that report's kept secret. We're not talking about that at all here. In fact, there's absolutely no discussion. And we understand that there is a plan to postpone consideration of the report till after Congress adjourns. Isn't that an abuse of power? It sure sounds to me as though the Gingrich case may never be concluded. We're even trying to shut down an IRS investigation of the tax-free foundations. I don't have enough time. By sending intimidating letters to the IRS commissioner, this is a shameful abuse of power. If it, this report had cleared the speaker's name, don't you think it would have been released in a heartbeat? Is it so damaging that the Ethics Committee has to keep it a secret? The American taxpayers laid out a half a million dollars for this report, and they have a right to make their own judgment about it. This committee is charged to oversee government operations on behalf of the American people. Sadly, I fear we've turned this hearing room into a parody of this duty. In the few days remaining in the 104th Congress, I urge the majority to at least attempt to provide us with some return for the dollar and call on the Ethics, report to release, uh, the Ethics Committee to release their report. Thank you. Thank you, gentlelady. The uh, chair now recognizes the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Hastert, for five minutes. Shocked the members of the other side in their attempts to try to obfuscate what's before us today by bringing everything from Waco and the dental records of the children that were slaughtered at, at Waco because Janet Rideau gave the order, order to do that. I'm surprised they brought that up, but they did. But all these things that we're talking about, we need to keep our eye on the ball. The ball is what happened in the White House travel office. That's what this report's about. It's about people's rights who have been trampled upon. 
It's about people who have not only been fired, but to preclude their firing, they brought in the IRS, they brought in the FBI, they brought in all these things so they could, you know, cast dispersions on their honesty. They've even, you know, put these people up uh, on trial. What kind of a country are we coming to? And this is in the White House. And you don't think the American people have the right to understand what's going on to American citizens that have been employed in the White House, people who aren't partisan, people who've done their jobs, but in order to give them an excuse to put their friends in an office, what they've done is to disperse their integrity, to question what they've done with the IRS, to bring the FBI in. Ladies and gentlemen, I think that's what the American people are worried about. That's what the concern is throughout this country that's happened in the last four years. And this committee, who has the ability to look through it, look at it, you know, examine it, and we've been doing it for the last two years, has that right to bring that report out. It's the right of the American people to know it, and no further obfuscation from the other side should be tolerated. I yield back my time. Still has time to the, uh, I will not yield to the, the gentleman, gentleman has yielded from back California. his time. The chair would now recognize the uh, gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Ken Jorsky, for five minutes. Uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. You know, we come to the end of two years, uh, and the best thought that I have on the subject is the action and the work of this committee over two years and the filing of this report really represents the measure to test the quality of the work of the 104th Congress. And that is that we have had the most extreme partisan Congress that wanted to act and change and cause revolution without evidence, without facts, and without logic or analysis, but in blind ideological attempts to attain an end, a political end, rather than a governmental end. I, I would have to say that probably the resentment of government felt by the American people is epitomized in the conclusion we strike today on this committee. It is exactly what they find wrong with the Congress of the United States, and it is reflected in the polls today of why they are going to reject the majority of the 104th Congress for the next Congress. Because the House of Representatives has been brought to embarrassment today. We have a report filed that is full of errors and conclusions unsupported by any evidence and, in a broad sense, at best by innuendo, and worse, that the evidence and the facts that were initially in that report indicate a professional sloppiness of a standard unseen before of a committee of the House of Representatives. How investigators and staff people of the majority could fail to know that the president could not possibly have a meeting in the White House when he happened to be 14,000 miles away in Japan. And all it took to ascertain that fact is a simple examination of the president's travel schedule or his meeting schedule. And when people don't make that simple investigation, so that they could not write it into a report, you have to question what facts or innuendos have they reported here that are totally made up, falsifications, or just poor sloppiness. And I think that's what's evidence here today. I think the most compelling question the American people, they have to ask us, why do you spend all these millions of dollars in 24 months? And why will that become or come to a screeching halt, and we could find the date, November 5th, 1996. There will be no further need for depositions, investigations, or hearings by this committee, because this is not driven by an intention of reform or oversight. It's driven with a political motive to attack the character of the President of the United States, and not only <laughs> as an elected official, but they've included his wife, I'm proud the, do the president doesn't have a dog because, like Fala, he would have been attacked too. Uh, 
I'm not sure whether we heard anything about Chelsea, but I'm surprised. I'm still examining some of the depositions and reports. I'm sure there must be something in there. That's, uh, yes, we did hear comments about the President's mother. That's how far uh, the majority has gone. But in all this time, of all these two years and all these millions of dollars, we did have an issue. There were seven people that were fired. One of these individuals was indicted and was tried, and there was hell raised as to whether or not this was a proper prosecution or persecution. And that trial ended more than 10 months ago, and the professional division of the Department of Justice could have been subpoenaed, could have been examined, to find out whether, in fact, there was an abuse of prosecutorial power and, in fact, persecution by that department of, uh, of government. And never was one deposition taken, not one subpoena of evidence from the Justice Department that would have reflect their mindset or thought process or investigation in the pursuit of that indictment or their prosecution. And never once, in over 300 days, did the, were those attorneys asked to appear here, either in camera or in open session, to explain why they picked on this dastardly individual? Now, I would have to say there's two questions there. Were we not aware of the fact that there was a prosecution? I'm not sure that I ever sat here one day and didn't hear Billy Ray Dale and didn't pass the Capitol Hill Club where fundraisers for defense were held on a regular basis, where members of the majority side of this committee attended those fundraisers, helped those fundraisers, indicating their partisan nature and what this represented. But more than that, over those 300 days, why didn't somebody say, if, if there is persecution in the Department of Justice of the United States, that is an impeachable defense? offense. That should be gone off to. That is important, not only to Billy Ray Dale, not only to members of the majority side of the minority side of this committee, but to every American. If there was, in fact, that's true oversight, that's true reform, why weren't those individuals ever deposed or called before this committee to explain their actions? No, they never were. Finally, I would have to say that I'm glad to see that we're approaching a signing die resolution of the 104th Congress. It's probably a Congress that we shouldn't adjourn, uh, adjourn by that resolution, but like horses, we should take it out and shoot it. The gentleman's time has expired, and the chair now recognizes the gentlelady from Maryland, Ms. Morella, for five minutes. I think I'd like to focus on some of the facts of this report. First of all, I'd like to commend Chairman Klinger for his thorough and fair investigation of the injustice done to seven federal civil servants. Let's not forget that. The effects that the firings have had on their lives and the lives of their families is really inexcusable. All White House employees, whether they're part of the civil service or political appointees, do serve at the pleasure of the President. The President can restructure the White House according to perceived needs or the plans of the administration. Nobody questions that. Indeed, Mr. Dale indicated that he and his colleagues anticipated that there would be changes in the travel office. But to fire seven loyal civil servants under the pretenses of criminal conduct without real evidence before a report was even complete is absolutely unbelievable and I think frightening. Back in January, Chairman Klinger held a hearing to focus on the impact of these political actions on the lives of those involved, something that politics had seemed to overshadow. The travel office staff members were career government employees with between 9 and 32 years experience in the travel office, including service to both Democratic and Republican presidents. They shared stories of their inhumane mistreatment. They reported to work one day, were told that they were fired as a result of their poor performance and mismanagement. Further, a White House spokesperson told the media that their termination was also due in part 
to findings of an FBI investigation, including potential criminal conduct. They were told to clear out their belongings, and after up to 32 years of service, were escorted from the White House grounds in a cargo van by the Secret Service. What a reward for their loyal service. They returned home to friends and family who had learned on television that they were fired in conjunction with an FBI investigation. Mr. Chairman, it's precisely these human effects that warrant this report. Federal employees, regardless of where they work, whether it's at the Justice Department, DOD, or the White House, should not be fired on the face of false allegations. What's so painfully apparent in this case is that false charges were brought against dedicated long-term federal employees to justify their firings. The American people demand that the United States maintain the most efficient and effective government workforce in the world. And in order to sustain this level of excellence, employees of the federal government must know that loyal and earnest public service will be honored and respected and recognized. I also want to remind my colleagues, as we look at what this report is really about, I want to remind them that Chairman Klinger's work piecing together the events surrounding the travel office firings led to the discovery of the hundreds of FBI files improperly requested by the White House. Everybody agrees this is an egregious violation of privacy. So again, I, I thank the chairman for his outstanding work piecing together the events surrounding the travel office firings and the FBI report, and I think it's appropriate that this committee uh, approve the report. And I yield back the balance of my time, Mr. Chairman. Uh, who seeks recognition? Uh, the gentleman from Texas. I might announce that I'm told that there will be a vote uh, somewhere between 11.15 and 11.30, and it is my intention to uh, have a vote on this uh, report uh, before, prior to the time we go for that vote. The gentleman from Texas. The point of order, Mr. Chairman. We're recognizing members for statements, and I think it would be inappropriate to deny any member a chance to speak on a matter before we vote on it, we can return after a vote on the House floor if necessary. The members' rights shouldn't be denied. I, I think this is indicative of the attitude of this majority in running this committee. If you're going to railroad this report through, which uh, has so little evidence to substantiate its conclusions. I thank the gentleman for his comment. Uh, the gentleman from Texas. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I didn't come plan to speak, so you won't have my remarks, but I was just listening to both sides, and, and I understand the, the concern, I guess, the American people may have about you know, travel office, but I really think the American people are worried about other things other than the, uh, the travel office. Uh, they're worried about their family, their children, their jobs, and they ask them about the travel office, I think you'll see their eyes glaze over, and I think the polls show that they're concerned about other issues, particularly... Uh, ones that are closer to home. I heard some of my colleagues on the majority side talk about that they weren't going to tolerate any more views, I think, uh, from, from the opposing side. I think that's what uh, the American people are saying over and over when they, when they respond to polls, that they're tired of that lack of tolerance we're hearing from the majority party. Uh, you don't want to hear somebody who disagrees with you. I think the, uh, the lack of civil discussion, particularly on this committee, shows uh, the, the whole tenor of Congress and that the frustration American people have with, with adults. We can't sit down and say, okay, let's look at travel office instead of making it such a, a partisan issue. I think like my colleagues on this side said, I think this, this issue may go away on November 5th, and that's probably for the best, particularly for the taxpayers. This committee has jurisdiction over lots of issues, not only travel office and investigations, but we also have jurisdiction over Medicare fraud. And I'm glad, as a member of the subcommittee uh, on, on this committee, we've devoted uh, some hearings to the estimated $40 billion loss to the American people and our senior citizens because of Medicare fraud. And yet, what are we here today? We spent most of our time on a travel office uh, that we spent millions on in full committee time, and yet uh, pennies on rooting out Medicare fraud. I think if we looked at what the American people really wanted, they would rather spend millions on rooting out the, med the billions in Medicare fraud than whatever happened in the travel office. I guess it's the frustration uh, that sometimes on both sides of the aisle, 
that we hear and when we see this report today. If there was wrongdoing, that's fine. Again, uh, let's deal with it. But also, I think our priorities are wrong on this committee with what we have seen, not only on this report, but previous reports. We spent almost 18 months now looking at a few scandals, and yet we have a $40 billion fraud, and we've devoted some time on the subcommittee on it. I think the American people are going to make that decision on November 5th when this report will be uh, dismissed. Will the gentleman yield if he's completed? Because he's. I'd like to uh, yield, but balance my time, my colleague from California. I, I thank you for yielding. I wanted to ask Mr. Hastert a question. He doesn't appear to be here. Uh, maybe Mr. Burton or Mrs. Morella can answer the question. What evidence is there for the conclusions of this report? You're going to be voting on this report. You've told us the report is, is a, a, a valid one. What evidence is there to support these conclusions? Mr. Burton? Read the report. Well, I thank the gentleman for asking that question. Uh, Billy Dale and his whole, whole staff was dismissed. It's all in the report. It's documented page after page after page. We all page. know he was dismissed. Well, what evidence is there of any asked, wrongdoing yeah. by the White House other than you didn't like the way they were dismissed? I didn't like the, it either. The, 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 the misuse of, of the FBI and, and, and trying to get information that could be used uh, against them in that court of law. He, the, the trial took place and it was dismissed in less than an hour after they'd ruined these people's lives. If I could I reclaim mean, my time, you know, I... I um, don't want to approve everything the White House did, but it seems to me to say that there was a misuse of power because uh, of the firing of people or, or well, if there was a prosecution of a man. You know, uh, O.J. Simpson was acquitted. That meant that there wasn't enough proof that he had done anything Would wrong. Would the gentleman yield? Now, uh, I thought Mr. Kinjorski made an excellent point. Would the why, gentleman yield? Why did, I will in a minute. Why didn't we ever see whether there was a misuse of prosecutor, prosecutorial authority to uh, initiate the actions against him. That wasn't the focus. We had 72 depositions of a lot of people spinning around. Most of it never even got out of here in hearings. If you're talking about misuse of power, what about the power to bring in uh, employees uh, who work for the federal government to, to, to respond to depositions on their drug use, their personal life? Ms. Morella, maybe you'd like to respond well, to well, that. Uh, you, I, well, you've indicated, briefly before you get uh, to this I, I still my time. You've indicated concern about federal employees being harassed. Right. What about the 72 people who are brought in for depositions and harassed with questions about their personal lives? Do you think well, you that know, was appropriate? Uh, Mr. Waxman, I, I think that it was totally improper that there be the request for Billy Dale's file from the FBI. Absolutely. And I would submit that this is very appropriate that this be in this report so that, again, we look ahead so this cannot happen again. Where is the specific evidence of wrongdoing? His, his file should not have been requested by the FBI. But, but Neither what, should what the 708 others. What page number in this report indicates that that was done improperly? There's a wrongdoing in that regard. Uh, would, would, the the gentleman gentleman yield? would the gentleman yield? Yes, I yield to Could Mr. we Burton. have our counsel enumerate some no, of the No, you're violations. the member. You're, the, you're going to take responsibility for voting for this report. I want to know whether you know what's in the report. Mr. Klinger, will, you want to respond? Will the gentleman yield to me? Yes. I would ask the gentleman, have you read the report? I've read the summary, and I've I seen how this committee is. I'm not well, defending this report. This is your report. I understand. What evidence but is I think, there? But no, I think, no, excuse me, Mr. Chairman. It's my turn. It is your time. My but question I'm to you is that presumably you've read the uh, report. I have indeed. And I want Several to know times. what evidence do you have to substantiate these allegations in the report? Yes. What specific there, evidence is there? But there's specific evidence, for example, that there was a deliberate, conscientious, and very, very, uh, you know, unauthorized attempt to airbrush out the role of the First Lady in terms of the firing of the Travel Office 7, in terms of the hiring of Craig Livingston. That's your conclusion. There's, Where's there's, the evidence? There's, of? there's plenty of evidence in there, and I would direct the gentleman to the report itself. I would encourage him to read the report. There is replete with evidence of, of uh, cover-up throughout this entire three-year period. I, I'd like a page site of hard evidence. I think what you're doing is making allegations in this report and then saying the report concludes, and therefore it must have happened. Uh, the time... Time's expired. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The uh, chair now recognizes the gentleman from Connecticut, Mr. Shays. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's lot lost on me that the colleague who asked the questions never gave our colleagues time to answer and was rarely at any of the hearings. Sadly, after all the documents, all Neal, the depositions, and all the statement. attempted dodging were left with one inescapable conclusion. Seven people's lives in the White House travel office were nearly ruined because some in the White House 
can't stop campaigning long enough to conduct the business of government capably and fairly. The damage from a botched attempt at raw political patronage was compounded by an arrogant and pervasive cover-up at the White House, the breadth and depth of which have remained secret, would have remained secret had this committee's inquiry not been pursued. Had this investigation not gone forward, the abuse of FBI files would have continued. Had the investigation and corruption uh, uh, investigation not gone forward, the misuse and corruption of the FBI and IRS would have even gotten worse. Had this investigation not gone forward, the true extent to which public employees and public resources were marshaled to conduct offensive public relations efforts would never have been known. And had this investigation not gone forward in the face of incessant White House delay, resistance, and spurious claims of executive privilege, a precedent would have been set that would have undermined the oversight authority of future Congresses, both Republican and Democrat. I commend our chairman and Mr. Klinger for his steadfast, even-handed leadership in the matter of the White House Travel Office, and I urge adoption of this report. And I want to point out and comment to Mr. Green's comment, the Subcommittee on Human Resource, which I chair, had 50 hearings. Nine subcommittee hearings were involved with health care fraud. He's a member of that committee. He knows it because he was an active participant in many of those nine hearings. Two oversight reports were adopted by this committee. One of those reports was the need for an all-payer health care fraud, making health care fraud a federal offense. In the health care bill, Title II, 80 pages of title to, in Title II of the health care reform bill included what our committee had done. What we had done is recommend that we make health care fraud a federal offense for Medicare, Medicaid, Champus, which is health care for the military, and an all-payer system. And so we are getting at waste, fraud, and abuse by the work of this committee, as directed by Mr. Klinger, and Mr. Klinger was at a number of those hearings. The bottom line is, this investigation was essential. My colleagues on the other side of the aisle fought it continually. We would have concluded this matter months and months ago. And I just have to think, if Mr. Klinger, when he was in the minority, had the opportunity to have brought this forward when Democrats controlled this Congress, you might have been able to write the report. But instead, you wanted to ignore the fact that seven people's lives were nearly destroyed because the White House couldn't simply admit one thing. They wanted to replace seven good people with their seven patronage appointees, which they could have done. When they were caught by the press, they didn't want to acknowledge the fact that it was patronage. That's all they had to do. So instead, they brought in the FBI and the IRS to go after them. These individuals spent a fortune clearing their names. Their lives were nearly ruined. And I just salute Mr. Klinger for the fact that he pursued. We never would have known there were 900 files. We never would have known about an individual who was looking at 900 Republicans in this Democrat Congress, breaking the law at every turn. There's a lot of things we don't know. We don't know what the President knew. We don't know what the First Lady knew. But we sure know this. There are a lot of people who worked for both the President and the First Lady who said, you got to go forward with this. you got to bring the IRS in. you got to bring the FBI in. And we know why. With that, Mr. Klinger, I read. Thank you. The Yield gentleman back. yields back the balance of his time. Who sees the recognition? The gentlelady from New York, Ms. Maloney, is recognized for five minutes. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, as we draw closer and closer to the election, the uh, rhetoric and attacks in this committee and on the floor are becoming more and more partisan, more attacking, and I might add uh, more unbelievable. This uh, important committee, and uh, Mr. Chairman, may I take this opportunity to congratulate you on your, on your uh, painting there that hangs in this important committee room that is supposed to have oversight and, and uh, seriously look at uh, ways to make government work better for the citizen's taxpayer. But how have we spent our time in this committee? And I'd just like to repeat that we've had three days of hearings on the travel office investigation four days on the FBI files, eight days on Ruby Ridge, 10 days on Waco, and then in banking, 26 days 
on Whitewater. But during this whole period that we focused on the travel office, we never focused on the real purpose of this committee, and I return to the title, Government Reform and Oversight, of how to make the office run better. And I'd like to note that uh, we never had a hearing on H.R. 2888, which is a piece of legislation which would privatize the travel office. If you're so concerned about how the, the travel office is being run and operated, why don't you privatize it? Every other day I go to the floor of the House and I hear a speech about how we should privatize government. You close down the government twice for 28 days. Yet here, I have a bill that would close down the travel office. You wouldn't have to worry about it anymore. You wouldn't have to have another hearing on it. You could just privatize it. And I might say that it, it followed the recommendations of a GAO report uh, that noted that in the office there, there was a financial mismanagement, there was no formal uh, procedure for procurement, poor accounting systems, ineffective cash management controls, and I, I just uh, respectfully submit that one solution, if you were serious about making government run better instead of attacking a sitting president, then you would have looked seriously at ways to manage the office in a more professional manner. But I then uh, submit to the record my own personal beliefs that this is a political witch hunt. It is a uh, politically motivated uh, attack. And uh, I would like to say that I do agree with one of the recommendations in the report. And I uh, refer to the recommendation which um, called for a chief financial officer in the executive office of the president to review the, um, the finances of the office. And I really truly believe that if we had a chief financial officer in the White House, then uh, we would not have had this problem. As Pete uh, Marwick and their auditors reported, they found in the travel office, and I quote, financial mismanagement of the travel office. And if we'd had a financial officer overseeing it, possibly we would not have had uh, this mismanagement and this entire incident would not have been there for you to uh, use in a partisan way. And I, I feel that this report is a, a, uh, one of a continuing uh, commentary uh, on the Republican agenda and uh, Republican facts on, um, on, on. I, would, I would be delighted to yield oh, to I my I just wondered uh, if, in Florida. fact, you'll be supporting me then this week. I think we're going to have, if Mr. Horn's successful, my bill up, uh, the White House Accountability. Uh, Act, which has a chief financial officer, and that that legislation should be for the before the House, and you'll be speaking and supporting that. I understand. I will uh, be speaking on it, uh, but uh, there are other items in that bill. Uh, we are not discussing that bill. We've had two hearings on it, and I have made my position uh, uh, well known on the record. But I do support a chief financial officer. Thank, thank you. Then the lady yields, and she still has more time available. I'm, I most certainly will. Um, this report condemns the uh, IRS, and I've seen no evidence of any problem or wrongdoing by the IRS. In fact, the Inspector General of the Treasury Department conducted an exhaustive review of IRS and completely exonerated it. Uh, and um, uh, if there was any problem with the IRS, I, we didn't hold any hearings on it. Mr. Chairman, what evidence is there that the IRS did anything wrong? Was this based on some press report, or is this all bootstrapping like the rest the of the gentleman would yield, I would ask yes. him to uh, cite where in the report we condemn the IRS. I mean, there is well, no... Well, Mr. Shea has indicated that, that the IRS... Well, if you can involved. cite me to the page where, in fact, that is the case, I'd be happy to respond. But my recollection, having read the report now three times, is that there's no condemnation of the IRS in this report. I'm pleased to hear it that Mr. Shea's information was incorrect because he indicated that the IRS had been involved in wrongdoing. But I would indicate on page 10 
there's a statement that says, unfortunately, Mr. Dale's speedy acquittal did not put an end to his three-year ordeal. The IRS pursued Dale, threatening income tax audits. The IRS also was busy in Smyrna, Tennessee, auditing the company that did business with Mr. Dale at the tra travel office, Ultra Air. That doesn't sound like a very favorable comment about the IRS, and I'd like to know what evidence there was for that. Why didn't we have hearings or any merely quoted the fact what the IRS did it was a factual statement of what the IRS did it doesn't necessarily condemn them for having done that but it did indicate that the uh, well, the pursuit of Mr. Dale Pete, persisted after uh, long after he had been in fact uh, removed from office members on the Republican side have said the IRS was part of a political effort to get Mr. Dale I see no evidence of that if they if they looked into his his uh, actions uh, that that uh, doesn't it isn't pr improper, and the Inspector General of the Treasury has indicated that nothing was done improperly. Time has expired. I w wanted to thank the uh, gentlelady from New York for her modified support for the report. We're, we're grateful for that, and I would note that uh, we have now had an equal debate on both sides of the aisle for this uh, report, and I would now recognize the gentleman from Indiana for a motion. Mr. Chairman, I'm the, point, the point of order, Mr. I Chairman. The previous question Mr. on the Mr. Point Burton of order, is Mr. Chairman. Members are still seeking recognition on this. Regular order, point. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, regular order. Gentleman from Indiana is recognized. I move Mr. Chairman, point of order. I move the previous question. I move the previous question. The gentleman from Indiana has been recognized for purposes point of making of a motion. Point of order, Mr. The Chairman. Motion has been made. The well, gentleman, Chairman, the gentleman will state his point of order. Members have been recognized for the purposes of giving opening statements. We have not completed the business before us, and it would be, it seems to me, improper to recognize any member for any motion until we have completed the pending I respectfully uh, understand the gentleman's point of view. I disagree with it. I would point to the gentleman from Pennsylvania that any member has an opportunity to file dissenting supplementary or additional views to this report. And I think that the uh, arguments that can be made against the report can certainly be included in those items. The what, motion Mr. now occurs Chairman, on the motion, the vote now occurs on the motion of the gentleman from Indiana. All those in favor Mr. Chairman, signify no by saying been, aye. Point yes, aye. Point it has order. been made. Point of order. No the motion, motion has been made. The motion You're was made. You're a little too anxious, Mr. Chairman, to railroad this Mr. Through. Waxman, the motion was made by Mr. There Burton. was no motion that was stated. We have not you heard a motion order. before us. The, if the uh, motion is stated, we want to debate that motion. It's and it's if it's not debatable, we want to make not, a point of inquiry about that. It's not now, debatable. Now, let's follow the rules and procedure of parliamentary governments, the, all the uh, way back to the English common law system. I, and don't throw it all out the window. I thank the gentleman so for his instruction on parliamentary procedure. The clerk will state the motion. To move the previous question. The motion has been made to move the previous question. It is not debatable. The motion now occurs on the motion to move the previous question. Mr. Chairman. All those in Mr. favor Chairman, signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed, no. No. In the opinion of the Request chair, the ayes have it. Vote. The ayes do roll have call it. Vote. A roll call vote is requested. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Klinger. Aye. Mr. Klinger votes aye. Mr. Gilman. Aye. Mr. Gilman votes aye. Mr. Burton. Aye. Mr. Burton votes aye. Mr. Hastert? Aye. Mr. Chairman, Mr. this Hastert is an outrageous way to behave, and I Mrs. request Morella. Democrats order, leave if Mr. we're not going to be recognized the gentleman even is out to of exercise order. our rights. I won't stay here, and I think you're railroading this report order, through. Chairman. It's an outrage. Clark will continue report, to call the roll. You have the majority. You ought to work Morella. its will to give the minority the right Mrs. at least Morella to take statements. Aye. Mr. Shays? I leave this committee Mr. with absolute disgust aye. for it Mr. and its Schiff? chairman. Mr. Schiff votes aye. Ms. Ross Layton? <laughs> Mr. Zellif? Mr. Zellif votes aye. Mr. McHugh? Aye. Mr. McHugh votes aye. Mr. Horn? Aye. Mr. Horn votes aye. Mr. Micah? Aye. Mr. Micah votes aye. Mr. Blute? Aye. Mr. Blute votes aye. Mr. Davis? Aye. Mr. Davis votes aye. Mr. McIntosh? Mr. Tate? Mr. Tate votes aye. Mr. Chrysler? Aye. Mr. Chrysler votes aye. Mr. Gutnick? Aye. Mr. Gutnick votes aye. Mr. Souter? Mr. Souter votes aye. Mr. Martini? Aye. Mr. Martini votes aye. Mr. Scarborough? Aye. Mr. Scarborough votes aye. Mr. Shattuck? Aye. Mr. Shattuck votes aye. Mr. Flanagan? Aye. Mm -hmm. Mr. Flanagan votes aye. Mr. Bass? Aye. Mr. Bass votes aye. Mr. LaTourette? Mr. LaTourette votes aye. Mr. Sanford? Mr. Sanford votes aye. Mr. Ehrlich? 
Mr. Klug? Mrs. Collins of Illinois? Mr. Waxman? Mr. Lantos? Mr. Wise? Mr. Owens? Mr. Towns? Mr. Spratt? Ms. Slaughter? Mr. Kanjorski? Mr. Kanjorski votes present. Mr. Condon? Mr. Peterson? Mr. Sanders? Mrs. Thurman? Mrs. Maloney? Mr. Barrett? Ms. Collins of Michigan? Ms. Norton? Mr. Moran? Mr. Green? Mrs. Meek? Mr. Fatah? Mr. Brewster? Mr. Holden? Mr. Cummings? Ms. Ross Layton? Mr. McIntosh? Mr. Ehrlich? Mr. Klug? Ms. Collins of Illinois? Mr. Waxman? Mr. Lantos? Mr. Wise? Mr. Owens? Mr. Towns? Mr. Spratt? Ms. Slaughter? Mr. Condent? Mr. Peterson? Mr. Sanders? Mrs. Thurman? Mrs. Maloney? Mr. Barrett? Ms. Collins of Michigan? Ms. Norton? Mr. Moran? Mr. Green? Mrs. Meek? Mr. Fatah? Mr. Brewster? Mr. Holden? Mr. Cummings? Mr. Chairman? Mr. Chairman? Point of order? Gentleman will state it. Mr. Chairman, I suggest the absence of a quorum. Um, vote, uh, the, the vote is occurring on the uh, report. And I suggest that the vote establishes a lack of a quorum. Uh, the vote is out the of order. clerk will call the roll for the quorum. Point of order, Mr. Chairman. Uh, we have uh, not concluded the, the vote, right uh, and I think that no. Mr. Waxman is present. Is it is out of order. Wait, wait, wait. Mr. Chairman, it seemed to me you'd have to complete the vote. Yes. And the report, vote. the gentleman is correct. The, the uh, clerk will report the vote. Mr. Klinger, there are 24 ayes and one present. M Mr. Chairman, I make a point of order. A quorum is not present, yes, and I suggest the absence of a quorum, request a quorum call, and in the absence of a quorum, I would move that the committee adjourn until a quorum is present. The uh, clerk will call the roll. Mr. Klinger? Present. Mr. Gilman? Mm -hmm. Present. Mr. Burton? What's a quorum? Mr. Hastert? Mrs. Morella? Mr. Shays? Mr. Schiff? Ms. Ross? Ross Layton? Yes. Mr. Zeliff? Yes. Mr. McHugh? Yes. Mr. Horn? Yes. Mr. Micah? Yes. Mr. Uh, Chairman, um, there is a vote on, and I'll pass at this point. To, you can come back to me. Quorum call. I'll pass. I'll come back. I'll, co I'll be recorded later. Thank you. Mr. Blute? Yeah. Mr. Davis? Mr. McIntosh? Mr. Tate? Mr. Chrysler? Mr. Gutnick? Mr. Souter? 
Mr. Martini? Mr. Scarborough? I am uh, present and regret that uh, the Democrats have decided to be crybabies about this, order, Mr. Chairman. especially Regular when they've order, been covering up for the President and Livingstone for many years, for, for many the, months uh, here. Committee. But I am Chairman. present. And I, I wish that they wouldn't Conventions play obstruction of justice the as they have. Because the, uh, if it were up for the Democrats, the we would have never learned about Craig Livingstone in the White House order. files. Order. They covered it up then, they're covering it up the now. From uh, Florida, is out of order. Mr. Shattuck? I'm pleased that the gentleman knows whether he's president or not. Well, I just wish that the Democrats were present because they've been covering up for the, several uh, months now. The Mr. clerk Flanagan? will continue to call the roll. Yes, Mr. Shattuck, I did. Mr. Bass? Mr. LaTourette? Mr. Sanford? Mr. Ehrlich? Mr. Klug? Mrs. Collins of Illinois? Mm -hmm. Mr. Waxman? Mr. Lantos? Mr. Wise? Point of order, Mr. Chairman. How many times does a clerk Mr. Uh, have to call the roll? We've had the roll call twice now. We, we I think this is the first. Are we going to go on indefinitely? No. Point of order. This is a roll call Present. vote to see if we have a procedure in this committee as we do call the by roll the gentleman. Mr. Towns? Mr. Spratt? Ms. Slaughter? Mr. Kanjorski? Well, like Mr. Scarborough, I think I'm present. Mr. Condent? Mr. Peterson, Mr. Sanders, Mrs. Thurman, Mrs. Maloney, Mr. Barrett, Ms. Collins of Michigan, Ms. Norton, Mr. Moran, Mr. Green, Mrs. Meek, Mr. Fatah, Mr. Brewster, Mr. Holden, Mr. Cummings, Mrs. Ross Layton, Mr. Micah. I believe that uh, I am now here. Thank you. Mr. McIntosh, Mr. Ehrlich. Mr. Klug, Ms. Collins of Illinois, Mr. Waxman, Mr. Lantos, Mr. Wise, Mr. Chairman, we've Mr. Been Owens, the call twice. I call the chair Mr. Towns, to a roll of the new Congress that says you Mr. cannot Spratt. have a continuing rolling. I just noted the presence form. of Mr. Moran in the hall. Oh no. Oh, you and I have previously the noted anyone, the presence Mr. of Mr. Waxman and Mr. Owens in the hall. Mr. Chairman, Mr. they are Cummings. not in the committee room. The chair cannot vote the presence of a committee. If the chair is going to take that on, I could assume we could go to the roll of the House and assume that there are 430 members Mr. in, the Chairman, in Washington order. City today. But they're not in this hearing room. Point and they're order. not uh, sitting at this committee. Point of order, Mr. Chairman. The gentleman will say it. Uh, at what point is it in order to ask the Sergeant of Arms to bring uh, the members to the, to the committee room for a vote? After we get an answer whether a quorum is present, if the chair will rule on the presence of a quorum, the and will the chair abide by a rule of the 104th Congress where a rolling quorum call would not be allowed? Regular order. Mr. Chairman, I asked I ask a question on a point of order. Could you answer me? We, at what as point? soon as the clerk has reported the presence or absence of a quorum, a motion would be in order. Thank you, Mr. Chairman compel the, uh, the attendance of members at the committee. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I have a parliamentary inquiry. The, uh, the, the gentleman will say um, The situation that we're in now, uh, the Democrats have... Uh, Mr. Chairman, there's the an outstanding is stating a parliamentary point of order. Inquiry. Of parliament inquiry. There's an outstanding Mr. point of order, a request for a quorum. No other business is before this committee until that issue is resolved, unless the chair is rewriting the rules of the House and the rules of this committee. 
Robert's Rules of Order in every uh, parliamentary procedure order says when there's a test of a quorum, no business can be tra transacted, no speeches made, no other motions taken up until there's an establishment of a presence of a quorum. We've had the roll call three times now. Are we going to sit here until you are able to send out your whips or sergeant of arms to establish a quorum, or are we going to proceed by regular order and determine whether or not there's a quorum present as called by the clerk and have that ruling made before any other motions is taken up before this committee? Or are we suspending the rules of parliamentary procedure? Mr. Chairman, I had a point of parliamentary inquiry re relating to the... I have a point of order and I demand a ruling on my point of order, Mr. Chairman. Well, the... Uh, Mr. Chairman, I have a point of order. Mr. We will, Chairman, we will, we will, two, one quorum, point of order before this committee. This vote, uh, given that we have the, Chairman. The con a conflicting view of parliamentary procedure here, the chair will consult with counsel briefly uh, to determine uh, the ruling in this event, and we, uh, we'll be right back with you. <laughs> There's Mac and Ty. Can you go upstairs and ask questions? What's that? Can you go upstairs and ask questions? Is the committee at recess, Mr. Chairman? I am discussing the point of order with Mr. Council. Chairman, this isn't a constitutional question of high magnitude. It's a simple application of the rules of the House in this committee. M Mr. Chairman, we see All Mr. Right. McIntosh is coming. Would you like to delay for several more members to appear while your whips are out working for a quorum, or are we going to proceed by the rules of the House? Rules of the House, I, I take the member's uh, point of uh, parliamentary inquiry, and we are prepared to Mr. Mr. see if, uh, Chairman, I had if any a, other member who has not been recorded seeks to be recorded. I had a, as a parliamentary uh, point of order, a question <laughs> relating to what constitutes a quorum in Mr. this Mr. Chairman, there's vote. no ruling on the present the, point of order before the chair. I request does any member, the chair does any make member, a ruling. Does any member seek to be recorded as present. The gentleman from Indiana. Mr. McIntosh, you're not recorded. The gentleman is recorded as present. Uh, the clerk will report uh, whether there, the presence or absence of a quorum. Mr. Chairman, there are 27 present. That being a quorum, the vote now occurs on the motion to approve the report. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, no. In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it, the ayes do have it, and the uh, uh, report is approved. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, inquiry, is that a previous question on the report that was called? The report was approved by voice vote. Okay, it is fully approved? Mr. Chairman, I, I then make an inqu a parliamentary inquiry to the chair. Am I understanding that now is that is a closed report and all amendments that were going to be offered to that no, no. report are no longer in order? No amendments to the report. That's right. All your amendments that were going to change that report are no longer in order, and the report as originally offered is now the established no, report of this committee. Report. Is that correct? No. Uh, that is correct. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> However, staff will have three days to make all necessary technical uh, <laughs> uh, changes. And members will have three days to file additional supplemental or dissenting views. So that means we can make changes? Mr. Chairman, I move the committee adjourn. Uh, the vote now occurs on the uh, motion of the gentleman to adjourn. All those in favor, favor signify by saying aye. No. Opposed, uh, no. No. The opinion chair, the noes have it, the noes do have it. I demand and a roll call vote. The uh, clerk will call the roll. Mr. Klinger? No. Mr. Gilman? No. Mr. Burton? No. Mr. Hastert? No. Mrs. Morella? Mr. Shays? 
Mr. Schiff? Ms. Ross Layton? Mr. Zeliff? No. Mr. McHugh? No. Mr. Horn? No. Mr. Micah? No. Mr. Blute? No. Mr. Davis? No. Mr. McIntosh? Yes. Mr. Tate? Yes. Mr. Tate? No. Mr. Chrysler? No. Mr. Gutnick? No. Mr. Souter? Yes. Mr. Martini? No. Mr. Scarborough? No. Mr. Shattuck? Mr. Flanagan? No. Mr. Bass? No. Mr. La Tourette? No. Mr. Sanford? No. Mr. Ehrlich? Mr. Klug? Mrs. Collins of Illinois? Mr. Waxman? Mr. Lantos? Mr. Wise? Mr. Owens? Mr. Towns? Mr. Spratt? Ms. Slaughter? Mr. Kanjorski? Aye. Mr. Condent, Mr. Peterson, Mr. Sanders, Mrs. Thurman, Mrs. Maloney, Mr. Barrett, Ms. Collins of Michigan, Ms. Norton, Mr. Moran, Mr. Green, Mrs. Meek, Mr. Fatah, Mr. Brewster, Mr. Holden, Mr. Cummings, Mr. Shays, Ms. Ross Layton, Mr. Shattuck, Mr. Ehrlich, Mr. Klug, Ms. Collins of Illinois, Mr. Waxman, Mr. Lantos, Mr. Wise, Mr. Owens, Mr. Towns, Mr. Spratt, Ms. Slaughter, Mr. Condent, Mr. Peterson, Mr. Sanders, Mrs. Thurman, Mrs. Maloney, Mr. Barrett, Ms. Collins of Michigan, Ms. Norton, Mr. Moran, Mr. Green, Mrs. Meek, Mr. Fatah, Mr. Brewster, Mr. Holden, Mr. Cummings. Clerk will report. Mr. Chairman, there are 25 nays and one aye. Mr. Chairman. And the uh, motion is defeated. Mr. Chairman, I move a quorum call. The, the vote just indicates there's not a quorum present. And I suggest the absence of a quorum. The uh, clerk will call the roll. Mr. Klinger? Here. Mr. Gilman? Here. Mr. Burton? I'm sorry, Mr. Burton? Mr. Hastert? <coughs> Mr. Hastert, I couldn't hear you. Mrs. Morella? I did. But Mr. Shays? Mr. Schiff? Ms. Ross Layton? Present. Mr. Zella? Present. Mr. McHugh? It's interesting, Mr. Chairman, that apparently the Democrats don't show up to work and the one that does wants to leave. I'm present. <laughs> Mr. Horn? Mr. Micah? I'm sorry, I wasn't paying attention. What was this vote on? <laughs> For a quorum call, Mr. Micah. Oh, um, I am uh, then uh, present. Thank you. Mr. Blute? Mr. Davis? Still present. Mr. McIntosh? Mr. Tate? Mr. Chrysler? Mr. Gutnick? Mr. Souter? Mr. Martini? Mr. Scarborough? Present. Mr. Shattuck? Mr. Flanagan? Mr. Bath? Mr. La Tourette? Mr. Sanford? Mr. Ehrlich? Mr. Klug? Ms. Collins of Illinois? Mr. Waxman? 
Mr. Lantos, Mr. Wise, Mr. Owens, Mr. Towns, Mr. Spratt, Ms. Slaughter, Mr. Kanjorski, Mr. Condent, Mr. Peterson, Mr. Sanders, Ms. Thurman, Mrs. Maloney, Mr. Barrett, Ms. Collins of Michigan, Ms. Norton, Mr. Moran, Mr. Green, Mrs. Meek, Mr. Fatah, Mr. Brewster, Mr. Holden, Mr. Cummings, Mr. Shattuck, Mr. Ehrlich, Ms. Collins of Illinois, Mr. Waxman, Mr. Lantos, Mr. Wise, Mr. Owens, Mr. Mr. Chairman, Towns, I suggest the clerk Mrs. is making Mr. a quorum call again. Ms. Slaughter, the rules of the Mr. House. Connett, Mr. Peterson, Mr. Sanders. Point of order, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Gentlemen, Thurman. Gentlemen, the state is point of order. The point of order is that we are now engaging in a ro rolling quorum call, and the rules of the House and this committee do not provide for that. The uh, clerk will uh, announce the presence or absence of quorum. Mr. Chairman, there are 28 present. Uh, quorum being present, uh, we can now move to the next order of business, which is the report. Uh, dealing, the next report to be considered is sampling and statistical adjustment in the decennial census fundamental flaws. Uh, the gentleman from Indiana. Would it be in order to move the adoption of the report? Mr. Chairman? Oh, the, the report has not been, at this point, brought up. The, the clerk, the gentleman, will state his point of order. I request that the chair read the report to the committee. Motion to be made. <laughs> Motion to be considered. The motion? The, the, the gentleman will state his point of order. Request that the chair read the report to the committee. Motion. Chairman, I move we dispense the with the reading of the report. The uh, motion is made to dispense with the reading of the report. Object All in favor of signify by Mr. saying aye. Aye. Opposed? The parliamentary uh, inquiry. It is my understanding you cannot move to suspend the reading of a report to this committee? I'd ask the parliamentary ruling on that. <coughs> the motion has been made to suspend the reading of the report. The motion was voted on. The uh, the motion was uh, was uh, was Chairman, approved. Point of order. The rules of the house. That that's why we have a rules committee that can waive rules of the house. But the committee cannot waive rules of the house except with of the committee without unanimous consent. And I object. A okay, motion is made. All right, Mr. Mr. Kanjorski has made a motion to read the uh, report. No, no. Regular order is to read the report. Regular order. That is, pres but you made a motion that you wanted the report to be read. Oh no, no, no! I made a, I made a motion to follow regular order, and regular order this committee is to have the report read to the committee, and it would take unanimous consent of this committee to waive that regular order. Um, Mr. Chairman, the, the, it would be appropriate at this point to have a motion. To suspend the reading of the report, <coughs> Mr. Which Chairman, was the motion was made by Parliament. Point Mr. of order point would of order. require a request for unanimous consent to waive the rules of this committee out of regular order. The reading of the report, Mr. Chairman, I request the uh, opportunity to speak on the point of order. My motion was my motion. Your motion was, was approved. Well, no, it uh, wasn't. No, it motion was not passed. Approved, Mr. Chairman. The point of order was made before there was a ruling. The chair will rule that a Mr. motion Chairman, would be in order. Mr. Chairman, before the chairman rules, may I be recognized the under the parliamentary procedure? First of all, I want to point out, Mr. Chairman, if you only let members speak, we wouldn't be snarled up in all of these procedural <laughs> points. All we asked was the right to make our case, right. and we were silenced in that regard. And all we ask on this next report is to be able to speak on it, because many of us have very strong feelings against it. If you allow that, then you may go to a vote, and you, undoubtedly you will win. But nevertheless, we are protected under the rules. And the rules say you cannot proceed with a report without reading it unless there's unanimous consent to waive the reading. It can't be done by a motion. The majority can't take away the rights of individual members of the minority. Now, we 
I think, would not object to the report being considered as read as long as we just have our five minutes each to say what, if, if members want five minutes, what our concerns are about this report and why we don't support it. That's all we ask as elected representatives of the same number of people that you represent. And we want to be able to express the views of our constituents. Don't cut us off. Don't railroad everything through. Don't act in an undemocratic manner and ignore the rules and all the parliamentary procedures. I thank the gentleman for his, uh, uh, for his comments. And, uh, and I we're appreciate on the census and I, report. And I appreciate the, the comments. And I would indicate that it would be the intention of the chair that we have a full and thorough debate on the merits or demerits, as you may view, the, the contents of this uh, census report. I couldn't agree with the gentleman more that this needs to be fully aired. Uh, so, uh, but I think it is not going to be productive if uh, the minority insists upon reading the entire report. The report has been available uh, for some time now to members to have uh, reviewed and commented on. I would assure the gentleman that it would not be the chair's intention to uh, summarily uh, cut off people's opportunity to say what they have to say about this report. And if, with, if that, uh, if that uh, the gentleman will state it. If the, point, if the chair is putting a motion to waive the reading of the report, I would ask an amendment to his motion that it be part of that motion that every member be allowed five minutes and at no point, as occurred in the previous report, could open discussion or debate for the five minutes reserved to every member be cut off. Well, I think, yeah, I think that the point here would be that not every member would be ob obliged to speak if they have nothing to say about the issue. Last time they weren't allowed, Mr. Right. Chairman. We, uh, just, we, we can't now have gentlemanly agreement as we usually proceed. Would the gentleman yield? The gentleman from Pennsylvania? The gentleman yield? Uh, gentleman the gentleman from Pennsylvania? Did the gentleman uh, yield? Yes. Yes. The question is, were they denied before they walked out of the room or yes. after they walked yes, out? Yes, we were. Absolutely. Will the gentleman yield? Will the, will the gentleman from Pennsylvania yield? I have further questions. Will the question. gentleman from Pennsylvania yield? Uh, the, um, my concern is, is that you attempted to prohibit the consideration of this particular bill by calling for a quorum without members present. And are we going to see continuing disruptive procedures where, in effect, we fill the buster? Or, or, or I, I want to finish my question. Or are you willing also, in your extended request, to then waive your right to do quorum calls and stalling tactics? In other words, if the chairman no. says that there can be statements, are you going to stage that as a filibuster and then a walkout again? No, we're Democrats, big D. <laughs> but we're also Democrats, well, little D. And as long as the majority recognize the democratic processes and the rules of the House and this committee, we are not going to do anything to obstruct. Then but why we're going you... to do everything to protect the rights of the minority to be heard. Well, the we're not going to allow further cutoff, as the chair summarily decided to do on the last proceedings, one of the most important reports to be filed by this committee in the entire 104th Congress. This chair and the majority of this committee did not see fit that every minority member should have a right to address five minutes to that report. Well, the well, I think that's the most undemocratic procedure I've ever heard. Will the gentleman yield? That you also objected to a quorum when we attempted to move to the second document. It wasn't just over the first document before you knew whether or not no, there was... No, absolutely. We now know the propensity of the chair to deny democratic processes and the rules of the House. And until the, we have assurances Mr. that those processes will be followed, we are going to take every right we have under the rules of the House and this committee to see that the democratic processes of the House of Representatives are Before, It's also a very convenient way to avoid voting no on the Travelgate report, and I think the record should show that. We're, we're not, we're, tra of traveling no, we would have perfectly been willing to have our statements, and you can bet your life this is one member Members that would have liked to buy avoided Before, before moving to the, the consideration of the census uh, uh, report, uh, the chair will take up another item of business uh, on the uh, agenda for this morning's hearing uh, as part of the committee's ongoing investigation into the White House travel office matter, which we've dealt with the report on this matter. Depositions have been conducted under the authority granted to it by House Resolution 369. That resolution granted to the committee authority to issue affidavits and take depositions under oath. While this authority under House Resolution 369 continues through the end of this Congress, the committee rule number 19, which implements this authority, initially expired on July 8, 1996. Rule 19 was then extended on August 1, 1996 at a committee meeting by unanimous consent to 
to allow for the deposition of Craig Livingstone. This was done solely to accommodate Mr. Livingstone's attorney, Mr. Turk, who had claimed to have had commitments he could not break. Today, I am asking the committee again to extend the deadline of Rule 19 until the end of the Congress when House Resolution 369 expires. It is not my intention nor my hope for depositions to continue to so late a date. But we have made very, very serious efforts to accommodate both witnesses and their counsel. Unfortunately, our good faith has been taken for granted and uh, by some of the witnesses who have sought unnecessary delays until after our deposition authority had expired. I would now ask the committee for authority to extend Rule 19 until the end of the 104th Congress and that the committee approve a subpoena for one Mr. David Craig Livingstone to be deposed on Friday, September 20th, 1996, or a date thereafter. Um, the gentleman uh, reserves the objection. This is a object. request before the committee? That is this a unanimous request. consent request? This is a request just... before the committee. And without objection, although the gentleman is, uh, will state his objection, uh, or reserving his right to object? Yes. Mr. Chairman, I understand uh, that you intend to have further depositions between now and the end of this Congress? That would be the, uh, that would be the authority that would be granted by this, uh, and, by this request. And the best information I have from a leakage of the majority side is that we're trying to look at a sine die resol uh, uh, resolution to, to adjourn this Congress on the 27th of September. And if my mathematics are correct, that means we have 10 days and That's in correct. that 10 days, does this committee intend to take the deposition and further sit on that deposition? The, uh, or are we going to rely on the release of this information through the way the report we just had before the committee got released, that is leakage or putting on the Internet? Uh, I can assure the gentleman that would not be the intention of this chairman. I indicated previously that I... Uh, I strongly object to the leakage of any information on reports well, out of this committee. And I would just state to the gentleman that the purpose of this request is primarily to get information from Mr. Livingstone, subsequent to information we've had from other witnesses who have been deposed by this committee, that contradict uh, statements uh, or that, uh, that render confusing statements that Mr. Livingstone made previously. Mr. Livingstone had agreed to come before the committee, had said on occasions that uh, we could work it out. We accommodated him, and it was only this past Monday when he, we were advised that, contrary to what he had assured us he would do, and that is that he would come in and be deposed, he then did not appear. So the only way that we can ensure that we get the uh, finality to, uh, to the accuracy of his statements is if he would come in and be deposed again. M Mr. Chairman, uh, further reserving the right to object, I, I understand, if, if I'm not correct, I, w I would like it uh, corrected, that Mr. Livingston has already been deposed some 30 hours. That has is appeared, indeed. Has that appeared under uh, oath before the full committee on at least one occasion or that more. That is correct. And had agreed to come in and be deposed okay. yet again. And I further understand that the majority is now preparing its final report for action in the next two or three days on what we call the Filegate matter. That is correct. And therefore, that report would be closed, and any deposition taken of Mr. Livingston after that time would obviously not be used for the final deliberations or the writing of the report of this committee. So it raises the question in my mind, if you're going to file a report, have it approved by the committee, why would you be asking for an extension of depositions beyond the period of time when that report will be approved and that deposition would no longer be usable to establish the facts, information, or conclusions in what the committee, majority of the committee is already prepared to report on? Well, our hope uh, is to uh, establish through Mr. Livingstone's deposition, which we would hope to take this Friday, uh, that we would be able to include if necessary, any information uh, acquired through that deposition as part of the final report. If that is not possible, I would certainly agree with the gentleman that this could not be made a part of the final report. But our objective is to be able to refer to the information that uh, either clarifies or, 
or disputes uh, previous information we have. If, if further reserving the right to object, you might understand that there are several limited questions that the council wants to inquire into, or are we just having a broad retaking of a deposition that could extend for hours? And if, uh, we want to accommodate the majority to be very careful that the facts and conclusions they arrived at are based on testimony and facts, <laughs> seeing the mistake that was made in the last report. But we certainly don't want to encourage an open-ended deposition that goes on, on ad infinitum and will be obviously used for purposes of publicity, leakage, and involvement in the presidential campaign. So what I'm inquiring is, are there several questions that the chairman is aware of through counsel to the committee that ha are to be resolved? And if so, can we contain this right for that purpose and have the understanding that a report will not be filed until that information is acquired? Or if a report is submitted to the committee for review, and passage that that would kill the authority See, granted to extend to take depositions. The, um, I cannot assure the gentleman that this is going to be a, a severely limited. We have had numbers of documents that have come forward uh, during the month of August which uh, have raised a number of questions uh, about Mr. Livingstone's previous testimony that we feel we need to explore. So I can't agree to uh, circumscribe or unduly limit uh, the extent of the investigation. My, uh, my hope would be and my anticipation would be that this could be done in a one-day uh, proceeding of deposition, but I would not agree to, uh, as I say, circumscribe or unduly limit the ability to look into questions that have been ar have arisen because of the uh, only recent receipt of documentation that uh, would uh, require us to look into those matters. Mr. Chairman, we want to cooperate with, with the majority and the chairman to get all the pertinent information. We do not want to cooperate in making this into a part of the presidential election. And you can see can that this is an unusual process and late in time in a presidential election when the majority is issuing things. Now, further reserving the right to object, I suggest to the chair that the rules of this committee provide three days notice, three calendar day notice, before a motion of this type could be put before the committee. I would suggest that rather than requesting the invoking of that rule, and the only way that rule can be uh, overcome is unusual circumstances. So I f would first make the inquiry of the chair what the unusual circumstances are, if there are any, or is there... The unusual circumstances, I would tell the gentleman, are that Mr. Livingstone, having in indicated previously and throughout uh, the month of August and into September that, uh, that he would appear voluntarily, that he would come before the committee and submit himself to an additional deposition, and we acted in good faith and accepted that in good faith, and it was only on Monday that we were advised by mail, by letter, from Mr. Turk that contrary to his assurance that he would do that, he is now declined to do so, knowing uh, that uh, the authority to compel him to do so had expired. So we felt that we had been gamed rather uh, severely uh, by Mr. Turk. That is an unusual circumstance that I think would warrant the waiving of the three-day rule. Reserving the, right to object. the gentleman that, was... That, that uh, explanation of unusual circumstance goes very much to the point I've been trying to make for the last hour at this committee. If you were aware of that fact on Friday or Monday, you had the three hours to notify the minority to preserve our rights to understand what was going on and to arrive at an understanding, rather than getting blindsided today, to have the chair rule that we waive that provision for three days on unusual circumstances when we don't really know or have had the opportunity to inquire and get all the information, and two, quite frankly, to work out an accommodation to assure that the work of the House of Representatives moves with a good process, with good order, but does not reduce itself to a fishing expedition or further political exploitation. And that, you have to understand, is a, a serious reservation of this member and I think the minority side. This is an unusually late period of time to be further deposing a witness that has been deposed for more than 30 hours has appeared here in person for hours on end, could have been asked any question. I would tell the gentleman that we had fully anticipated that we would have been able to depose Mr. Livingstone in August in a, in a very... Uh, uh, but we've had... Mr. Chairman, a regular he, order. This is a point of order he's making. It's not... Yeah. It's, it's not well, the, the gentleman, right to... Mr. Mr. Chairman, let me confirm. Regular order. Does the gentleman... Regular order has been called for. Is it, could it be understood 
that if there is an extension of authority, which we, we, we are sympathetic to grant, we want to see that you get to all the facts and information because we think it benefits the position of the President. There isn't any question about that. So we want all those facts laid out to the public. But could we have an understanding that if we express that, and I, 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 I do not object further or raise any rules of procedure, that the sine die resolution of adjournment would automatically expire the, the authority granted, and that the deposition would be limited to Mr. Livingstone only, and all others' rights would be waived, and that we, we know what the conclusion is going to be. We're going to call one witness, and if it's not done, or if the report's filed, or if we have a sine die resolution of the House for adjournment, no further activity and no further extensions allowed by this request. The, I would point out to the gentleman that my understanding of the authority of the 104th Congress does not expire until the swearing in of the 105th Congress, regardless of the sine die uh, resolution. The request of the chair is for an extension of authority that's already expired. And, and we're trying to accommodate the chair to give that extension. And I, I don't think there's anything tricky. I hope you understand nothing I'm saying to you. Normally, sine die resolution would adjourn the authority. Normally, you're making the request only for Mr. Livingstone. And if we were to grant those two requests, I can't understand why that wouldn't accommodate I, uh, the, the, the opportunity that the majority and the chair is seeking. I can tell the gentleman that I, we are going to make a, every conceivable effort and a, as good faith an effort as possible to conclude this matter. Uh, within the confines of the, of the uh, before the sine die resolution. I, I can also tell the gentleman that it is certainly my intent that at this point that I would not seek to use this authority uh, for other than Mr. Livingstone, who is the gentleman who we thought we had an agreement well, then, with. Who then, then can we understand on. that the chair is saying that that is a clear understanding, that this motion would be amended to say that the authority expires when the sine die resolution of a German. I can't passed. agree to that. Uh, I cannot agree to that. I can't agree that we would tr we would do everything possible to limit well, well, uh, the we, resolution. Well, we've had, Mr. Chairman, we've had those zone. agreements before. Regular we order, Mr. We Chairman. Here today, does the agreement I, I that we would have five minutes per member? Regular order, Mr. The Chairman. The um, uh, the gentleman, if the gentleman has an objection. All I can assure the gentleman is we are going to do our very level best to conclude this within the Mid confines of this uh, before the sine die. I Mid can't guarantee well, that that Mid will Mid be the case. I can assure the gentleman that at least my intention is to, I mean, my, our main purpose here is to get Mr. Livingstone to respond to some documentation and other things that that well, he uh, he needs to respond to. For to practical this. purposes, if we may just go on to, the, the chair is aware of the fact that even if we granted all the process thus far in favor of the majority, there would be no ability for the House of Representatives to issue a contempt order after a sine die resolution because the Congress of the United States, the 104th Congress, would have adjourned. Mr. Chairman, regular order, please. So it would seem please. not unreasonable for the chair to recognize. What I am worried about, quite frankly, as, as a member of the minority, is I have seen the, the chair exercise his power and prerogatives in what appears to be a very serious, informed way, but then has a way of suggesting there's unknown quantities, unknown facts, more work that has to be done, lack of cooperation, when in fact we've had more cooperation from everyone in this investigation than ever in the history of the United States government. And I don't think that seven weeks before presidential election, I want to see my good friend from Pennsylvania, the chairman's face on CNN, suggesting that we don't yet know whether we need a, a, an exhumation of a body or some other unknown quantity that could be suggested out there. Uh, so, you know, I, I think it would be very reasonable for the chair to say, if you know that there is a fundamental factor in information that you want to pose under oath by Mr. Stevenson, that you, in a matter of hours, could obtain that through counsel. And Would that the gentleman state uh, his I've point of order, Mr. Chairman, and get on with the The chairman has stated what he is prepared to do, and I must ask the gentleman if you have an objection to I have state an objection, the objection. Then, Mr. Chairman, that the three-day notice to this committee has not been exercised, and that, and that the motion of the chairman is out of order until that objection is noted. Reserving uh, the right to further object, Mr. Chairman. The objection is noted. The, uh, well, there seems to me it's a question of what is being objected to. A point of order is only in order, Mr. Chairman, is it not? No. Uh, that's it's correct. No, there's a unanimous consent request no. pending. Uh, he, objection has been heard. 
Uh, he's objecting. So, he has objected to the. Uh, so there's to nothing the, uh, pending. So there's nothing pending. Uh, I think a motion would be or in order to to waive the three-day rule in view of the Mr. fact Chairman, that so the gentleman has objected. It's been moved that the, we waive the three-day day uh, notice. Mr. Mr. Chairman, point of order. Uh, you're well, waiving Mr. the Chairman, rules. Call for the vote. The uh, point of order, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to be heard on my point of order. As, as I understand that we have rules that say you have to give three days notice to members so we know what's coming up. You want to waive that by majority vote. My inquiry to you is uh, if that can be waived by a majority vote, is that motion debatable? And if it is, I would like to be recognized to speak on that motion. I would note to the gentleman that I am advised by counsel that uh, I, as the chairman of the committee, have the authority to waive the three-day rule in the event of unusual circumstances. As I indicated to the gentleman from Pennsylvania, I felt that the fact that Mr. Livingstone had, in fact, uh, stiffed us in uh, being unwilling to appear and to uh, testify under oath on matters that we felt were the... And That's exactly what this chair has done for two years. I, Mr. Uh, Living gentleman, Mr. Chair, regular order, Mr. Gentleman order. is out of order. Order, Mr. Chairman. The gentleman is out of order. That's and in view of that fact, order, uh, I am going to exercise my authority to say that there have been unusual circumstances here because of, if Mr. Kanjorsi obsessed with the word stiff, then I would indicate that he did not appear, and as he had promised Here's to do. 30 hours, Mr. Chairman. He did not appear, as he had indicated that he would do, to respond to new information that arose because of documentation we received during the month of August. So on the authority, on the Chairman's Mr. authority, Chairman, I would waive the three-day rule, point, point of and order. the rule is hereby waived. Point of order, Mr. Chairman. The gentleman will state his point of order. M Mr. Chairman, we're trying to accommodate you. Exactly. On this what's the request, point of order, Mr. Chairman? may I Chairman, may I proffer a proposal to the chairman, which may cut through all of this? Otherwise, we're going to go through three or four procedural votes. Right, gentlemen will state it. If you want Mr. Livingstone to come in and give further testimony, let's bring him in and hold a hearing, and let members come in and question him. Not have these staff. What's the point of order, Mr. Chairman? Uh, well, just, why doesn't the gentleman just cool it for a minute and see if we can What is the it? point of order? The, 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 you keep the, talking no, about I'm Robert's rules a, of order. No, this What's is not the point a point of order? order. I'd like to make a unanimous consent request. The gentleman will state his unanimous consent request. I, I would uh, ask unanimous consent that the chairman be given further authority to call Mr. Livingston for further inquiry by the committee at a duly noticed hearing of the no. committee. The gentleman, I'm sorry, I cannot accede to that request. I can advise the gentleman that... If, when, when and if Mr. Livingston appears, and he will be under subpoena to appear, uh, that every member of the committee has full authority to attend uh, that deposition and to be present and to question Mr. Livingston. So uh, I, I think the gentleman recognizes that due to the lateness of the session, we really are not in a position to continue holding could, hearings. Could and I would not, and as the gentleman from Pennsylvania stated, it is not our intent to make political hay out of this. This, this would be huh. guerrilla. This would be guerrilla theater. Mr. Chairman, rather than the gentleman a is stating hearing of a deposition, the minority side would like the American people to hear Mr. Livingstone. Point, point of information. The uh, point of information, Mr. Uh, Chairman. Generally, it was stated. I, I, I would uh, really like to ask uh, and have clarified earlier. Seventy-five uh, staff members of the White House were deposed, and never were we able to question them or to question what happened. This committee was completely circumvented. And, and I agree with uh, Mr. Waxman that we should have the opportunity to um, listen to Mr. Livingston's uh, uh, statements. Uh, I, I believe- Regular we, order, Mr. Chairman. They're stalling know, on this Mr. vote. Mr. Chairman, that, that the true content of what was learned from these staff members were completely uh, changed by overzealous staffers on the other side of the aisle with a political motive because there was no uh, meeting of this committee to review what was learned from those, those uh, 75 members of the, that were already deposed. And I, I think that the issue that uh, Mr. Waxman raised of the, of the need to have the committee review the statement is a legitimate one. And uh, my question is, if you waive the three-day notice, how in the world are we going to be able to know the, uh, when gen you are... Is, uh, gentle lady, I think I'm going to have to... Con, uh, uh, cut you off. Uh, we are moving toward a, a vote here very shortly, and I would uh, ask uh, Bill for the uh, vote on the question now. Mr. Chairman, this, uh, point, 
this is a debatable motion, and I'd like to be recognized to debate the motion. The question has been called. No, the question has, Mr. Chairman, first of all, you've made up a rule that... Uh, all right, the gen I'm sorry, the question has not been called. The gentleman is recognized. Mr. Chairman, I have never heard of this rule that allows you to waive the three-day notice in extraordinary circumstances. But nevertheless, you've done that. And the motion before rule us, two. If, if I could get it pinned down, maybe we don't have a, a dispute about it. You want to bring in Craig Livingston for a further deposition. He's the only one you want to further depose. You're willing to limit your motion to him alone. Uh, are you willing to limit it to one more deposition of Mr. Livingston alone? If, uh, or, and let me make, even though you're not willing to say it has to be before the Congress is signed to die. Mm -hmm. Or are you going to have more than one deposition of Mr. Livingston? No, I mean, uh, but I can't, I cannot uh, at this point circumscribe what we need to do. I mean, Mr. Livingstone uh, may turn out to be extraordinarily verbose, and that would require him to come back again if he, I mean, we, I think it's unrealistic to think that we can arbitrarily at this point uh, limit the amount of, uh, of time we deal with them. I, I, I've told the gentleman my objective here is to have Mr. Livingstone come in for one further deposition, which we hope would be able to cover Mr. all Chairman, the questions that are outstanding. The I move the previous question. M Mr. The Chairman, po the point, of order, uh, point of order, we don't have the point, point, point of order, Mr. Chairman. The Point of the, order, uh, the previous question has been ordered. Point of order, Mr. Chairman. The previous question Point of order has, order has to be recognized prior to a previous question. <sighs> previous question was already asked. That is not an accurate uh, parliamentary Mr. question. Mr. Chairman, I, I was recognized and I had the time. I haven't yielded it back. I made an inquiry. The chairman discussed uh, what he wanted to do on my, uh, in, on my uh, request to him to have a public hearing or whether it was going to be one deposition, one deposition only. Now I want to make a point of order. I'd like to see something in writing. If we have a motion before us, what is it we're voting Regular on? Regular order, Mr. And Chairman. Secondly, the previous question there is has a been ordered. There is a vote on the House floor, and let's vote on that, on that and then get the matter before us Mr. Chairman, in writing Regular so we can make vote on it know what ordered. we're voting on. Well, we've got to get this. Uh, the clerk can report the motion. The previous question. The the motion is what is the previous moved. question? What is before us for which the previous question has been moved? The Wait, is there something in writing the before previous, us? The motion. The, mo the motion is to extend the ability of this committee to take uh, depositions to the end of this Congress and to also authorize the issuance of a subpoena to Mr. Livingstone to appear before the committee on fri this Friday or at some other date. Uh, and those, that, that is the motion. So Mr. The Chairman, Rule 16 of the House says, every motion made to the House and entertained by the Speaker, which would again apply to the committee, shall be reduced to writing on the demand of any member and shall be entered on the journal with the name of the member making it. The, uh, the, the Council will distribute a copy of the uh, motion. Now the motion is being offered before the us. Motion now then the question is, is, Mr. Chairman, whether this motion should be read or not. But the previous question has now been called. No, Mr. Chairman, there cannot be a previous question on a motion that has not been properly put before the committee. And I, and I further make the point of order, there's a vote on the House floor. Second bells. Things are cool off when we vote. The uh, committee will stand in recess uh, until 10 minutes after the, uh, well, until until 12.45. At this point, committee members recessed for approximately 40 minutes, during which time they agreed to further question Craig Livingstone. The uh, Committee on Government Reform and Oversight will uh, resume its sitting. Uh, when the committee recessed, there was a request to read the motion uh, that had been made in the interim. Uh, there have been discussions between the majority and minority uh, with regard to how to proceed on the question of 
getting Mr. Livingstone to appear before the committees to discuss uh, various matters that have arisen since his last deposition. And uh, agreement has been reached with regard to that matter, which would presumably not require a vote. Uh, but the agreement would be to extend committee rule number 19 for the purpose of taking sworn testimony in a deposition of the Committee on Government Reform and Oversight from David Craig Livingstone and further to authorize the issuance of a subpoena commanding the appearance of David Craig Livingstone. And I would uh, uh, believe that has been, I think that accurately states the agreement that there is a further understanding that it is our earnest and fervent uh, wish that this be done, uh, that the deposition of Mr. Livingstone be taken uh, prior to the adjournment of this, uh, of this House of Representatives signing die and we are going to do everything possible to ensure that that is the case. Um, but we will not put an arbitrary limit on that in the event that, uh, largely because of something that m may occur with Mr. Livingstone, we would be required to go beyond that time. Uh, I believe that accurately states the, uh, the agreement that we've reached. Uh, Mr. Kanjorski? Mr. Chairman, I want to uh, congratulate the Chair in working out what is an accommodation between both the majority and the minority and to get to whatever additional facts are necessary from this witness and that we can finally bring this matter to a conclusion. So I compliment you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, gentlemen, very much for that. We are now prepared to return to a consideration of the other report. Uh, I think I was just stating an agreement. Uh, well, uh, the, it suggested that perhaps we should have uh, a request for unanimous consent that that agreement between the majority and minority be agreed to and without objection it is so ordered. During the break, members agreed to grant the committee authority to depose Craig Livingstone before the conclusion of the 104th Congress. The House is expected to adjourn during the next few weeks. The committee moved on to other business at this point. Here's a look at House and Senate action. The House Wednesday passed about eight suspension bills. Suspensions are designed to move through the House quickly, require a two-thirds vote, and are not amendable. Also, members...